appendix of early days of old oregon by katherine barry judson this librivox recording is in the public domain appendix a brief summary of the history of the old oregon country from original sources up to the time that the british colonists in america in seventeen seventy eight were engaged in that great war which we know as the revolution nothing whatever was known of the northwest coast of america and little indeed even of the californian coast except that spanish missions had been planted there the expedition headed by captain cook he himself was killed in the sandwich islands and never returned to england published a brief one-volume report of the voyage immediately upon its return in seventeen eighty a complete three-volume report was published in seventeen eighty four and while this laid no great stress upon the fur trade it verified the reports of officers and crew whose interest had been so great that after the sale of their furs in china they almost mutinied in their determination to go again to the northwest coast for furs in seventeen eighty five british adventurers entered the trade first across the broad pacific from china crept the sixty-ton sea otter captain hanna who returned within six months with twenty thousand dollars worth of smooth beautiful sea otter skins that same year other adventurers sailed for king george's sound or nootka sound as we know it some sailed from london such as portlock and dixon others from the orient as did john mires and others from continental ports as barclay from ostend the problem with all of them was the fact that this trade in the pacific ocean would conflict with the chartered monopoly of the east india company since the best market for the furs was at canton china the fur traders tried to get around this in various ways some secured licenses from the east india company which left them without danger but also without freedom in selling their furs and a consequent loss of profits for all sales to the chinese were made in the oriental fashion of dickering others sailed under foreign flags as barclay under the austrian but great britain could not claim the results of the explorations of such and the britons themselves did not like it still others as miras used double sets of flags miras had both the portuguese and the english flags where it was safe he used the english where he was likely to encounter the east india company or any of their officers he used the portuguese not until seventeen eighty seven did the americans appear first gray and kendrick followed almost immediately by captain ingram of the brig good hope and many another american ships immediately after the revolution were lying idle and as americans were not hampered by the chartered monopoly of the east india company and the fur trade was profitable they soon controlled the business to a very large extent the american plan was to sail to the sandwich islands cut sandalwood and get fresh vegetables and supplies go up the coast for sea otter skins walrus ivory and seal skins then go over to the south sea islands barter with the natives for edible birds nests for chinese soups and other rarities such as beige la mer and sail for china with their varied assortment of products receiving payment in teas silks embroideries and strange china ware now so ordinary to us but so quaint in those days with perhaps a few chinese gods to add flavour to the cargo by eighteen twelve or eighteen fourteen the british were fairly driven off the northwest coast yet it must be noted that although americans developed this trade owing to freedom of action which the british traders did not possess great britain had scored first in both discovery and exploration not only by sea but by land that is had scored first after spain and spanish explorations were very slightly known and very superficial great britain in her trading along the coast following up her discoveries was soon followed by americans on land she not only scored first but was not followed by any nation at all hearn discovered the coppermine river in the far north mackenzie afterwards sir alexander discovered and explored the peace river in seventeen eighty nine 
in seventeen ninety three he explored the headwaters of the peace river and followed down the headwaters of the fraser as far as the fifty-second parallel then crossing overland to the pacific near the mouth of the bella coola river he thought this last river was the columbia emptying into the ocean about latitude forty six degrees and named it the tatouche test knowing nothing of gray's discovery of the year before the lower fraser was later explored by a briton of that name but its lower mouth was not discovered until eighteen twenty four and then by the british an exploring party of the hudson's bay company but spain relying upon her first cursory exploration of the coast claimed it all as hers and hearing in seventeen eighty nine that fur traders were harbouring on the coast she immediately took prisoner british ships and sailors whom she found in nootka sound in that year letting americans go scot-free for some reason and sent them to mexico the seizure almost caused war between spain and great britain but was ended by the nootka sound convention of seventeen ninety by that convention england was granted the right to the northern section of the coast where she had been trading spain to the southern or california coast where she had been planting missions while the stretch in between from about latitude forty two to forty nine degrees was declared to be open to traders or settlers of either nation it must be noticed that at the time this division of the pacific coast was made by these two nations america made no protest of any kind indeed she could not she had no right on any grounds to any part of that extensive coast two years later through gray's discovery of the columbia river in seventeen ninety two america received unofficially a claim to territory drained by the river the extent of the claim would depend upon who discovered the upper river america's claim received some emphasis eighteen years later when john jacob astor a fur trader of new york organized the pacific fur company and sent two expeditions to the mouth of the columbia one went overseas in the tonquin one overland with terrible sufferings under wilson price hunt the tonquin arrived at the columbia in march eighteen eleven and at once founded fort astoria the badly managed overland party did not arrive until february eighteen twelve washington irving's well-known story of astoria is fairly correct in its story of such events as the founding of astoria in the sufferings of the overland party and in its purely descriptive work though in the actual building of the fort it follows the blithe french-canadian franchet who wrote for his friends at home and the actual difficulties of that feat are underrated the recital of alexander ross a sombre literal scotchman is much more correct both accounts are to be found in the early western travel series edited by reuben gold thwaites but washington irving is not correct in his astoria on anything which touches the rivalry between the british and the americans for the fur trade he practically worked in collaboration with astor brings out none of that miserly genius's mistakes and blames all difficulties and the final failure upon the treachery of the american partners years of careful study of documents letters etc as well as a thorough knowledge of the columbia river have convinced the writer that there was no treachery in the sale the nor'westers hearing through montreal of the sailing of the raccoon sloop of war with the isaac todd an armed supply ship came down the columbia with song and good cheer from fort spokane to tell the astorians of their fate the nor'westers had no food and no ammunition yet encamped just outside fort astoria outnumbering the astorian party most of the latter were also british subjects and in no mood to fight against their king and country for a man from whose mistakes and suspicion they had suffered so much so the american trading party in the fort kept on as good terms with the nor'westers as possible no furs were bought for nine months from the indians by the astorians because all trading goods had to be kept to pay the indians for food ammunition was supplied to their british enemies outside and peace was maintained to the credit of both parties 
meanwhile wilson price hunt astor's personal agent was always away when most needed and during these long months of waiting and tension the astorians sold fort astoria with fort okanagan and fort spokane to their rivals the bargain was not to be closed until hunt's return and although he objected at the start to the sale yet as soon as he realized the hopelessness of their position he assented both to the sale and the prices this is a fact which irving ignores if indeed he knew it but the journal of alexander henry in the volumes known as the thompson henry journals brings out the point clearly the tonkin had been blown up by the indians in clackwit harbor the beaver by reason of an overcautious captain never returned the lark was wrecked in the south seas a fourth ship about to be sent out had to be withheld so with no ship and with no means of getting their furs across two thousand miles of savage haunted deserts with trading goods growing scarce with little ammunition and no food except what could be secured from the indians with payments of trading goods their position was hopeless franchere's argument of easy escape is childish no one can stand at the mouth of the columbia to-day and not understand the hopelessness of the american position the price paid by the northwest company for astor's beaver was two dollars a pound the usual canadian or british price astor claimed he should have received five dollars per pound which was the highest price paid in new york as well as by the chinese in canton sea otters were sold at a sacrifice also as well as other furs the prices were as high as could have been obtained anywhere at auction astor always claimed on all furs the highest price paid at canton china but the astorians were three thousand miles from china across a stormy ocean with no ship and with a naval war in progress values at canton and among the helpless partners at astoria were necessarily not the same even omitting the expense it would have been to get the furs across the ocean the cost of crews and traders food time etc and danger of capture as a prize and the claim is absurd one of the strongest proofs of the helplessness of the americans was that the canadian traders had not only their furs but their fears the journal of alexander henry the younger shows that had an american ship appeared after the sale the canadians could not have saved their furs in a letter to the secretary of state in later years astor claimed that the men had all become naturalized that was utterly untrue and the statement only made to secure himself from criticism as he knew when he engaged them and contracted with them that war between the two countries was imminent other statements of similar nature do not bear investigation however to go back two years in that first summer of eighteen eleven after the tonkin had gone north never to return a small party went up the columbia to found an interior trading post this was fort okanagan the following summer eighteen twelve the astorians established fort spokane immediately adjoining spokane house built in eighteen ten by the canadian company the northwest company of montreal other explorations without permanent results were made by the americans along the snake river and in the willamette valley on the basis of these two fur posts in the upper country the americans claimed the entire oregon valley or columbia valley in the controversy over the border yet the british had been ahead of the americans on the upper columbia in eighteen o seven david thompson geographer astronomer and fur trader for the northwest company had crossed the canadian rockies after spending years in battling against its difficulties and the cowardice of his voyageurs who were admirable boatmen but no fighters he explored the sources of the columbia and the country of the pandare the coeur de laines and the kootenays he came farther down and by eighteen ten had founded spokane house at the close of the war the canadian fur traders were in full possession of the trade of old oregon but they had no monopoly as against either british or americans it was a field for open competition and rivalry 
still no american came into the country although their ships cruised along the coast trading in the harbors and inlets and rivers but founding no posts and doing no inland trade then in rather spectacular fashion and only on a rather extraordinary interpretation of the treaty of ghent fort astoria was restored to america in eighteen eighteen the diplomatic restoration was verbal and for the fort only not the country later the americans claimed the restoration of the country and there was no legal paper or documentary proof of the fact that only the fort had been restored as a matter of fact the treaty provided for the return of forts captured during the war astoria was bought and paid for even though it was through fear of capture but the northwest company did not find the oregon country one of much profit they were in serious difficulties with the hudson's bay company in the red river country of canada food and supplies and men could not be brought readily over that long long trail from montreal to the pacific including the high passes of the canadian rockies and it was most expensive to send them from either montreal or from england around the horn to oregon even without that the trade was not well managed the traders were always in difficulties of one kind or another with the indians through the lawlessness of the lower classes of servants which made it difficult for small parties to be sent out and hard to coax the indians into hunting for pelts the climate of astoria was not good the dampness mildewed the furs and the clothing the mud seemed bottomless the chilly gray foggy days depressed the hungry discontented men officers of the company at fort william were almost disposed to give up the country when in eighteen eighteen they sent out donald mackenzie with special powers and he at once changed loss into profit he had been one of astor's partners and could have given him valuable assistance as he was an experienced trader and possessed of remarkable control over the indians but astor's jealousy and suspicions gave him no place of authority and was one element in the failure of the astorians meanwhile owing to the red river troubles parliament ordered the northwest company of montreal and the hudson's bay company of london to merge this was done completely in eighteen twenty one under the name of the older and more famous company and the fur trade of all british north america and oregon reorganized in eighteen twenty four having reorganized the service elsewhere george simpson governor in north america afterwards sir george came down the columbia river one rainy november day with the new chief trader later chief factor dr john mclaughlin an experienced trader a trained physician and a man also of remarkable character and abilities their immediate decision was to place their central fort in a better location and the prairies opposite the mouth of the willamette river were selected for the new post the climate was drier and sunnier the soil adapted for the raising of grain and vegetables the fort accessible to their ocean-going ships and yet ninety miles nearer the tribes of the upper country than astoria or fort george as they called it after the sale here on the upper prairie nearly a mile from the river was built the first fort vancouver beginning in the late winter of eighteen twenty four and early spring of eighteen twenty five shortly after about eighteen twenty eight finding themselves too far from the water both for personal use as well as shipping the fort was removed to the lower prairie almost on the river bank now partly occupied by columbia barracks at vancouver washington this second fort was the one so well known to american settlers missionaries and pioneers meanwhile the united states as shown by diplomatic papers did not intend to give up this country on the western coast america did not expect to occupy it herself and even so late as eighteen forty four after thousands of settlers had gone there united states senators said on the floor of congress that a separate nation must needs settle there because of the vast stretch of plains and mountains between the states and the pacific but it must be one of american form of government american ideals and american sympathies california belonged to mexico until within a year of the settling of the boundary problem
year after year one senator or another brought into congress a bill for the occupation of the oregon which received more or less discussion but failed the missouri senators were most vigorous in this because missouri was interested in the fur trade and their jealousy was bitter toward great britain's success in getting it feeling at that time was very bitter towards the british on all points senator benton's false statements made in congress his charges that the british were murdering thousands of american trappers and traders that they were instigating the indians against the americans that they were claiming a country which was indisputably american came near bringing america into a third war with great britain and almost every statement he made based on the allegations of jealous traders themselves are now shown by original documents to have been entirely false senator lynn tried to carry the oregon bill because as his congressional friends frankly admitted his re-election depended upon his efforts in this direction and he had no other means of earning his living than that of senator he was a likable man breezy and friendly and his senatorial friends wanted to help him earn his living so many of them on one occasion voted for his bill though it was in defiance of the treaty with great britain america said oregon in these days and thought of the columbia river and astoria and robert gray as well as the fur traders who had sailed up and down the coast great britain said oregon and thought of mackenzie and hearn and fraser of captain cook and vancouver who explored puget sound in seventeen ninety two and of mires and portluck and dixon one country thought of the lower one-third the other of the northern two-thirds each said oregon the geography of the country was little known no wonder each country was surprised at the claims of the other even before eighteen twenty two however great britain gave up all claim to oregon south of the columbia river in eighteen eighteen at the time that fort astoria was restored she had entered into a joint occupancy treaty with the united states by which it was decided to allow traders and trappers and settlers and fishing vessels to trade or settle in the country whether british or american because they could not decide the possession of the country this treaty was for ten years in eighteen twenty seven it was repeated this time indefinitely either country to end it by a year's notice this cleared things up because the two other countries which had claims had surrendered them to the united states spain surrendered all those under the nootka sound convention when she sold the floridas in eighteen nineteen and spain had claimed oregon to the far north except as limited or left undetermined by that convention france had had rights of contiguity because oregon lay immediately west of louisiana but those had passed to the united states in eighteen o three when she sold old-time louisiana now suddenly in eighteen twenty one russia appeared claiming oregon and the north pacific as a closed sea this was settled by treaties between russia and great britain and russia and america in eighteen twenty four and eighteen twenty five by which the czar accepted fifty four degrees and forty minutes as his southern boundary and left great britain and america to settle the division of the coast between them but it was the spanish claims even though limited yet left unsettled by the nootka sound convention sold to the united states and also this treaty with russia that led the american people that is the people as a whole to believe that american rights extended into the far north that led in eighteen forty five to the cry fifty four forty or fight it would have been a most unrighteous war for america for she had no more right either by discovery exploration or settlement to the northern section of the old oregon country than she had to the british isles her rightful claims were all south of the forty-ninth parallel and the best informed men knew this even in eighteen eighteen again in eighteen twenty four and again in eighteen twenty seven america had offered great britain the boundary line of the forty-ninth parallel just where it is to-day because america wanted the great harbors of puget sound otherwise the forty-eighth parallel might have been offered for we had no real right north of that the harbors were a commercial necessity and the country was determined to have them 
it will be seen therefore since great britain before eighteen twenty two gave up all claim to the country south of the columbia and america from eighteen eighteen on until eighteen forty five made no claim to anything north of latitude forty nine degrees that oregon never was in danger of being lost as a whole the only section of the whole country about which there was any dispute at all was that south and west of the columbia river as it winds and turns like a pair of stairs through the state that is the only section at stake was the western half of the present state of washington the number of men who saved oregon has been increasing as rapidly as the vast amount of furniture which came over in the mayflower no one saved oregon because oregon was never in danger of being lost only half a present-day state was in dispute and from eighteen fifteen onwards there was no chance of that being given up for the statesmen as their letters and papers show were determined to have those harbors on puget sound the columbia was a barred river and unsafe during much of the year san francisco harbor belonged to mexico the tradition of whitman saved oregon grew out of fear webster did at one time think that he would give up any claim to the puget sound ports if mexico could be induced to give up the harbor of san francisco his opinions on this subject were the same after whitman visited washington d c whether he saw webster or not is not the question as they were before whitman left oregon there was a rumor of a trade and popular opinion said webster was planning to trade oregon for the fishing rights of the northeast coast there was no truth in this american fur traders did not appear in the oregon country until well into the eighteen twenties when they trapped through the snake river countries and finally by eighteen twenty seven reached fort flathead on the northern flathead river then others came but only on trading trips nathaniel j wyeth a cambridge man came in eighteen thirty two going directly to the heart of things by making his way to fort vancouver he had high hopes and great enthusiasm no experience a small borrowed capital and plans which looked well on paper he had a few followers as inexperienced as himself some of whom deserted him en route the rest immediately upon their arrival in oregon their arrival at fort vancouver was late in the fall a most interesting story but never yet published his ship due in the columbia river had been wrecked in the south seas he was dependent upon the generous hospitality of dr mclaughlin and the fine character of both men is shown in the warm friendship between them lasting long after wyeth's return to the east although wyeth had gone into the oregon country to overturn the great english company if he could or at least to compete for the fur trade wyeth as stated had a small borrowed capital the hudson's bay company was an immensely wealthy corporation managed on military lines with a thousand trained men at the posts and on the trails between hudson's bay and the pacific ocean a company which allowed seven years to elapse in their monetary estimates between the time when trading goods were purchased until the furs bought by those goods were in their hands and sold no individual without knowledge of the trade or influence with and knowledge of the indians could hope to succeed yet wyeth's failure was charged to the sinister influence of the hudson's bay company with the indians although they made no effort to oppose him noting his inexperience and seeing him foredoomed to failure as many more experienced men had failed they simply made friends with him and showed him every courtesy in eighteen thirty four wyeth returned to the oregon with a few men a little experience borrowed capital and with plans which still looked well on paper he had with him en route a large assortment of trading goods for american traders in the rocky mountains at their annual rendezvous a feature of the fur trade well described in irving's bonneville his countrymen refused to accept the goods they had ordered or to pay for them wyeth thus thrown upon his own resources built fort hall near the present fort hall stocked it as best he could left a few men in charge to trade with the indians and passed on to his english rivals and friends in the oregon country 
with him on this journey was jason lee and his nephew daniel lee the methodist missionaries who settled immediately in the willamette wyeth found his ship safely in the columbia this time but luck was against him he was too late for the salmon run and he was depending entirely on salmon profits now waiting until the next year the run was only half as large as usual and the indolent indians had all they could do to catch enough for their own winter supplies without bothering with the stranger the hudson's bay company neither raised their prices for fish nor lowered them on trading goods all documents and even private letters show that they gave him a square deal yet wyeth's failure was charged by americans to british efforts to hold oregon for the british crown though the british crown was at that time refusing permission to canadians to colonize in oregon meanwhile the lees settled in the willamette valley receiving every assistance and kindness from fort vancouver and a few years later numerous additions were made to the mission even though a fever of preceding years had almost wiped out the indians in the valley jason lee's unpublished defense of himself states clearly that he looked upon this body of missionaries as an american colony intended to hold the country for america good farms received more attention from them than actual mission work yet the mission exercised a good religious influence so to speak was a religious centre for the white settlers when they came in and later became an academy politically however this mission made much trouble jealous of the british fearing lest the attractive country with its open pleasant prairies and its forested tracts for the willamette is to-day a charming country should fall to the british americans sent petition after petition to congress urging it to extend the laws of the united states over the country and making many serious misrepresentations against fort vancouver and alleged british ambitions while refraining from acknowledging the cordial and unlimited assistance in credit and supplies given them by the agents of the british company they appealed for aid against the indians and others who would do them harm in eighteen thirty six marcus whitman the devoted missionary of wailaptu with his charming devoted wife with dr and mrs spaulding and w h gray a carpenter the author of perhaps the most malicious history ever written came over the plains and settled among a noble type of indians near fort walla walla they devoted themselves to their work receiving their reward eleven years later in death at the hands of the indians because the angry tribesmen believed themselves about to be wiped out by the disease brought into the country by the throngs of immigrants the massacre came be it noted after the firm hand of control exercised by the hudson's bay company had been lifted by the treaty of eighteen forty six the indians knew then that the americans whom they hated were to have their country it was peter skeen ogden chief factor of the hudson's bay company who taking trading goods from the company's post at fort vancouver went up the columbia at the risk of his life and almost single-handed forced the indians to give up nearly threescore captives doomed to death or slavery the letter of acknowledgment from the provisional government at oregon city admits this fact meanwhile the willamette valley was being settled by eighteen thirty eight and eighteen thirty nine american mountain men trappers from the rocky mountains with their indian wives and little half-breed children drifted into the willamette valley for the fur-bearing animals of the rocky mountains had become practically annihilated the eighteen forties saw the beginning of a stream of genuine settlers crossing the plains the prairies and the mountains with their white-winged schooners their ox-teams tugging at the heavy loads while the black ox goad sang in their ears many of the newcomers reaching oregon late in the fall had all they could do to shelter their heads and feed their families during the winter and but for the generous help given them by the blue-eyed rosy-cheeked white-haired man in charge of fort vancouver they could not have survived their first few months of hardship in this chilly rainy climate after the strain of long months in crossing the continent many did go on to the sandwich islands and to california some having changed their route while crossing the plains and others drifted down from the north dissatisfied with the more gloomy northern climate 
the ill reports of oregon brought down into california by hundreds of these emigrants reached the ears of british consuls and vice-consuls there as well as in the sandwich islands which was the rendezvous for every ship in the pacific and a general centre of gossip led to representations to the british foreign office by their own subordinates that oregon was not worth fighting for that it was better to give up part of the country than to quarrel over it many of these immigrants in the willamette claimed that they came to save oregon came because of their love for their native land knowing before they came that they could get a mile square of good farming land for the asking perhaps with some of them the word native might be left out such a man as peter h burnett for example one of the finest characters who came to oregon admitted frankly that he came for the land he was heavily in debt in missouri his family shaking with chills and fever there was no trade and his only chance for getting financially on his feet again was his arrangement with his creditors that he be allowed to come to oregon and take up all the land allowed for himself his wife and each of his several children a tremendous tract of fertile country to be had simply for the taking days were rough as in all pioneer countries but not nearly so rough as they were in many of the western states still by eighteen forty three the needs of laws were apparent and a provisional government was formed by the americans and the laws of iowa used as a basis until some settlement should be made as to the border two years later because of the encroachments and difficulties created by a lawless type of settler against the hudson's bay company the provisional government was reorganized so that the english company might join in with them without losing nationality or affecting their rights as englishmen this gave the company a certain protection but gave also to the americans the force of the company's influence and power both in connection with their control over the indians as the americans had antagonized the natives and their trade with their system of trading posts as well as the fact that fort vancouver was a necessity to the americans for supplies and protection among these early settlers were deserters from whalers law-breakers and fugitives from justice old fur trappers who hated the british company hated the red flag of britain's commerce which flew over that wooden-walled fort with the white half monogram h b c on the lower edge of the red folds such men as these threatened to drive out every man in the valley who had an indian wife some americans but chiefly french canadians old servants of the company who had tilled their farms for years and had comfortable houses and threatened also to burn down fort vancouver some were adventurers from the sandwich islands and with them all was a goodly number of the finest class of american pioneers men determined honest hard-working law-abiding good husbands and good fathers seeking better opportunities for themselves and better futures for their children such men as these gave the predominant stamp to the country and by their industry developed it so that it has grown at a marvellous pace aided by its attractive scenery and delightful climate developed it so that a few years later other desirable men bankers business men the professional classes who lacked the liking for the rough edge of a pioneer's life followed in their footsteps and built up the country Today, this old oregon country makes up the states of oregon washington idaho northwestern montana and all of british columbia of all the characters which stand out in the history of early oregon for nobility and grandeur the most striking is that of dr john mclaughlin the father of oregon as he is now called and correctly so sympathy food clothing seeds ploughs and cattle to draw the ploughs as well as supplies of every sort were sold to the americans at the regular company prices over the first cost in london credit was long it took years to collect some of the debts even of honest men most of the americans repaid him others did not mclaughlin supplied all work possible for the americans even glutting the shingle market at the sandwich islands in his efforts to help them 
he was an old man when americans knew him imperious as his position demanded for he kept in order in a wild uncivilized country from five hundred to a thousand subordinates many of them of the rougher type besides controlling and holding in check eighty thousand indians some of whom were cannibals since eighteen twenty nine he had picked out the falls of the willamette as a future home when old age should make retirement advisable picked it out the year that etienne lucier the first to settle there was allowed to make his home in that valley the company were under bonds to return their men to their homes or to the civilized world when their engagement expired so the company in order to allow these men to settle in a comfortable climate where farming was possible and they could provide for their families were forced to keep the men on their rolls though without pay this point led to much misrepresentation by the americans mclaughlin himself dreaded a possible return to the rigors of the climate of eastern canada that the hatred and misjudgment of americans should have embittered his later years is a cause for keen regret for his friendship for americans was generous and genuine his loss of his position was not due as is usually stated to his refusal to drive the americans out of the country it was due to differences of business judgment between him and sir george simpson the governor in north america and to mclaughlin's personal bitterness towards sir george for the attitude of the latter toward the death of young john mclaughlin who was killed by his men at the fur post at stikeen now alaska it was a disgrace to the company as sir george saw it but it was a terrible blow to the father this summary is brief indeed but the history of oregon is the most romantic history of any section of the united states and the fascination of it lies in the fact that the old history still echoes through the forests and along the broad streams of the country and gleams in the snowy peaks the grandchildren of many a man who helped to settle the old oregon country are still young people barely out of school some of a younger generation are still mere children in school it is but right they should know its early history end of appendix end of early days in old oregon by katherine b judson